From Fishes Out of Water, we're now going to Alien Fishes in Motion. And I'd like to welcome Leo Nico. He's an ichthyologist from the United States Geological Survey. And Nico's going to, to talk, or he, the presentation is called Here, There and Everywhere, Alien Fishes in Motion. Welcome. Thank you. So I'm very honored to be here. Uh, I thank fish, the fish base organizers for inviting me, and I really appreciate the kindnesses of Dr. Michael, Michael Norin and Sven Kulander and Andrea Hennier, and I hope uh, all of you here find my talk of interest. Now, when I was a young undergraduate student, I enrolled in an ichthyology course taught by Dr. Jamie Thomerson. And I remember on the first day of class, Professor Thomerson noted that some of us not, might not become ichthyologists. But he added that if any of us pursued other careers, such as an airline pilot or an astronaut uh, or were ever passengers on a plane, the knowledge gained from his class might serve us well. Dr. Thomerson explained that if our if a plane we were, on, we were on happened to crash land in whereabouts unknown, we, we would be able to determine where we were, were simply by sampling and identifying the fishes found in the vicinity. Now, prof the professor expected his students to learn fish zoogeography, the branch of science concerned with the natural distribution of animals. And he explained that the, di the different regions of the world even different river and lake drainages contain their own unique uh, fish fauna. Now, indeed, there are many books devoted entirely or nearly so to fish zoogeography. Examples are Bear's 1981 Atlas on the Distribution of Freshwater Fish Families, Banner Rescue's 1991 book on freshwater animals of North America and Europe, and Albert and Reese's 2011 book on the zoogeography of neotropical freshwater fishes. Now, according to the science of zoogeography, over the past 200 plus million years, plate tectonics interacting with biological evolution has helped determine how fishes and other organisms are naturally distributed around the world. However, over the past 150 years, humans have been scrambling the distribution patterns of many fish taxa by moving them around, releasing species into waters where they do not occur naturally. And this has resulted in major changes to fish faunas throughout the world, from small drainages to entire continents. Now, many researchers consider the phenomena of species introductions by humans to be unique. And Lockwood et al. in their 2007 book on invasion ecology argue that human-mediated transport is faster, more dynamic, and often encompasses a larger geographic scale than natural animal dispersal. Indeed, the magnitude and importance of fish introductions are reflected in the many books and journal articles published over recent decades on the subject. There is even a journal devoted entirely to aquatic invasions. So let us reflect on Professor Thomerson and try to put to use our zoogeography wisdom in today's world. Imagine at this moment we are astronauts circling the Earth in a space capsule and we encounter problems. We black out and our space capsule drops to Earth. Our GPS is destroyed, and after some hours we awake on the ground, whereabouts unknown. We'll imagine our crash site, unbeknownst to us, is in a remote part of the Everglades of South Florida. And as recommended by Dr. Thomerson, we sample the local fishes. And what will the fishes tell us? We will be confused. Florida currently has more than 35 non-native fishes that have formed reproducing wild populations. Many are foreign taxa, species from other parts of the world. 
In South Florida, we might catch Bellanese socks and jaguar guapotes from Central America, catfishes and cichlids from South America, tilapia and other cichlids from Africa, swamp, head, swamp eels and snakeheads from Asia, and perhaps even a common carp from Europe. Now today I will talk about non-native or alien fishes, mostly about their pathways, distribution, and spread. But first I'll review a few terms, then I'll throw some numbers and maps at you, and lastly I will tell the stories of three different fish taxa to highlight the diverse types of fishes introduced and also illustrate the different types of invasion pathways and their complexities. Now, much of my early career as an ichthyologist involved the study of South American freshwater fishes. I became a graduate student of Dr. Thomerson, and in 1980, he sent me to Venezuela, where I did my field work on annual killifishes. I returned and did my PhD field work, also in South America, a study of the trophic ecology of piranhas. My career abruptly changed in 1993, over 25 years ago. I was hired by the U.S. Department of Interior to be an invasive species expert, an invasive fish expert. So I shifted from studying fishes in their native habitats to studying some of these very same fishes, but in places far outside their native range. Now, the field of invasion biology has its own terminology and jargon, although there is lots of inconsistencies. The term alien is used by many researchers, especially in Europe, and this term typically refers to a species that, through human actions, has been introduced into the wild outside its natural geographic range. Other terms with the same or similar meanings, meaning includes introduced species, non-native, non-indigenous, exotic. Established or naturalized refers to introduced species that have formed reproducing populations in the wild and generally are considered self-sustaining. Invasive species refer, refers to introduced species that form large numbers, are reproducing, and have a tendency to spread. And typically they are, uh, are likely or are causing some type of harm. I define invasion pathways more broadly than many others. To me, it is the route a non-native species travels from its source area, uh, such as its native range, to where it is released or escapes into the wild. But it also takes into consideration the physical route and the human-mediated means of transport, as well as the reasons behind the introduction. Now, an introduced species must pass through a gauntlet of barriers to transition through the different phases of invasion. Barriers, as shown by the five different vertical color bars, can be geographic, environmental, climate, something related to the species' own attributes. It could be regulations imposed by uh, governments. Now, Gary Larson had fun explaining how French poodles were introduced to America. But the pathways of non-native fish are also diverse with some surprises. Fish invasion pathways and the reason for their introduction range from aquaculture purposes all the way to zoological park escapes. You know, some were, are for conservation purposes, some part of religious rituals. They, some introductions are intentional, some accidental. Many introductions are authorized, pr uh, allowed by governments, but many are illegal or unauthorized. Uh, in many cases, though, we don't know or can only guess at the introduction pathway are the reasons behind an introduction. So this work re requires a, a fair amount of detective work. While preparing this presentation, I asked myself two questions. 
how many living fish species are in the world and how many of the fish species have been introduced outside their native range. Well, according to experts, there are about 35,000 named valid fish species in the world. Also, according to Fish Base, 930 fish species, or about 2.7% of the world's total, have been introduced at least once somewhere on the planet. And of these, 588 fish species are considered to be established or possibly established in at least one location. Now we can talk about numbers and kinds of introduced species at a variety of geographic scales. For instance, we can assume or examine and count only foreign species, ones introduced from a different continent. Now this map is the estimated numbers of foreign fish species established in a few major uh, regions of the world. As you see, Asia and North America have about 60 foreign fish species uh, established in inland waters. Europe and the islands of the Pacific are close behind. We can take a closer look at North America where approximately 60 foreign fish species are established. Asia has contributed the most, followed by Africa and South America, each with 12. Eight fish species found in North America are from Eurasia. All eight of these species have natural ranges that span parts of both Europe and Asia. North America is also a source of foreign fishes. For instance, at least 24 of the foreign fish species established or possibly established in Europe are North American taxa. Now, both North and South America are donors as well as big recipients of foreign fishes. They donate about the same number of species as they receive. For example, North America is the source of 21 foreign fish species established in Asia, and 20 fish species from Asia are established in North America. So there's a kind of an equal exchange. But such equal exchanges are not always the case. This map provides partial information on the relative numbers of native, foreign, and transplanted fishes among 26 river drainages in North America. Now, if you look at the pie graphs, white represents the relative number of fish species in each river system that are native, red represents the uh, foreign species, and yellow are species transplanted or introduced from other areas of North America. So western streams in North America have relatively few native fishes uh, compared to the east. Consequently, by zooming in on this same map, we can better see that the uh, addition of even a few non-native non-natives in the western US streams is fairly dramatic graphically with transplants commonly outnumbering native species in some cases by more than three to one. Okay, so much terminology and numbers and maps, not many fish pictures. By this point in my talk, my oldest grandson Simon would be fast asleep, but I hope you all stay with me a little longer. Now each of the hundreds of introduced fish species have an interesting and unique story to tell. Uh, their own unique histories of invasion. So during the remainder of my time, I will tell you uh, an abbreviated stories of three different fish taxa, black carp, Asian swamp eels, and African tilapia. So the black carp, Mylopharyngodon Pisces is an Asian member of the family Cybr Cyprinidae. It's a big fish, the largest of the so-called Asian carps. It's known to reach two meters or more in total length. In parts of China, 
It's a food fish of humans, a delicacy, and some Japanese anglers love it as a sport fish. The black carp is native to East Asia, ranging from southern China, possibly uh, northern Vietnam, north to far eastern Russia. It occurs in subtropical to tropical rivers, but historically it is especially common in the Yanks and, and Pearl Basins. The black carp is a carnivore and adapted to feed on snails and bivalves. As you can see here, their pharyngeal or throat teeth are similar in, in appearance to human molars. And these teeth enable them to crush the shells of most mollusks that pass into their mouth. Now in the 1980s, U.S. fish farmers began importing and rearing black carp as a biocontrol agent uh, to control diseases caused by snails in aquaculture ponds. As a result, the species was widely distributed in the, Mis in the Mississippi Basin area, the farms in the basin, especially used by catfish farmers. And in the 1990s, it was estimated that there were over 800,000 black carp in fish farms within the basin. Of the many farms holding black carp, only one confessed that their stocks escaped into the wild. And this is typically the case. In April 1994, 30 black carp reportedly found freedom in the Mississippi River when a private aquaculture pond was inundated by floodwaters. However, during my work with commercial fishermen in Louisiana, I learned that, they, that these same fishermen had been collecting a few black carp every year throughout the 1990s, taking the fish in, in deep-set hoop nets. They had always assumed that these fish were simply dark-colored grass carp, another Asian carp that is uh, very common in the Mississippi. Now, captures by commercial fishers indicate wild black carp. The population now ranges from the mouth of the Mississippi River in Louisiana north to Illinois. So this is the most up-to-date uh, map that we have of their uh, distribution. They have not yet been reported from the Great Lakes, but there is a connection. Our genetic analysis reveal that at least three different haplotypes are present in the wild introduced population, indicating high likelihood of multiple introductions. Now, black carp, so I guess, uh, let's see what happened here. Are you seeing two slides? Oh, no, no I guess it's okay. Black carp require access to rivers to complete their life cycle, and most suitable are large floodplain rivers. They migrate long distances, sometimes hundreds of kilometers. Uh, and uh, in fact, the um, there you go. in fact, places like the Mississippi River Basin are probably more suitable to black carp than the rivers in in China. Now, the silver carp in the Mississippi Basin is easy to detect because it responds to, to shocker boats, but the black carp is a bottom dweller, does not jump, and thus its numbers and dispersal are not easy to track. So we're probably underestimating its distribution in numbers. So my next story is about Asian swamp eels, members of the family Sembranchidae. Now, swamp eels are eel-like fish native to both the New and Old Worlds, parts of South and Central America, Africa, Asia, and Australia. They show a, a variety of interesting traits, and they're well adapted to survive the pathway all the, route, all the way through to invasion. Here's an illustration I 
drew up for a book chapter I'm working on, kind of sh uh, showing some examples. Uh, these swamp eels are air breathers. They're capable of overland travel, can survive long periods outside of water, uh, sometimes months as long as they're kept moist, even without food. They're highly fossorial, spend much of their life in burrows or buried in the mud. Some naturally undergo sex reversal. Uh, they exhibit parental care of eggs and young, and most are tolerant of a wide range of salinities. Now, the three, three swamp eels in, the, in this uh, upper part of this figure are taxa native to North America, but these North American natives are, o are only found in southern Mexico. There are no uh, swamp eels native to the U.S. or Canada. So the other photos are the Asian swamp eels that have been introduced and established in North America. And based on my just reanalyzing the information that I've gathered, it seems that they've come in two waves. Wave one consisted of three groups belonging to what I am calling the Monopterus albus javanensis species complex. Now on the mainland, as you can see, clade A was, first, was the first to be found in the wild in, in, a, in a pond in North Georgia, and it's since spread out, spread through, the, through a river, connected river system, and that was in the early 1990s. Later, members of the same clade were found in New Jersey. Clades A and B have been present in Florida since 1997, and as you can see here, clade C consists of two color forms. The second wave involved the relatively recent introduction of Amphipnus cuchia. Now, Amphipnus cuchia can be distinguished from members of the Monopterus complex by a few morphological traits. Uh, I commonly just, when they're uh, with live individuals, look at how they're taking in air. Uh, the cuchilla has uh, cheek pouches like a chipmunk. So when it takes, gulps in air, it, their head expands uh, laterally on uh, both sides. In contrast, uh, members of the uh, monopterous complex, they do not have these pouches. When they take in air, they hold it in the mouth and it expands the ventral part of the throat. <laughs> Looking at the native ranges of these two groups, the Monopterus complex ranges from Java and nearby areas northward all the way up into northern China and Korea. So they're not just a tropical group. And Fitness Kuchia ranges from Pakistan and India east into at least Myanmar. It was 1997, I was alone one day coming from a meeting and I happened to have my dip net in the vehicle and my rubber boots and I was in an area where there's lots of uh, ornamental fish farms in Florida. It's near Tampa, a rural area. And some of these farms are abandoned. It's always good to sample there just to see what might pop up and I unexpectedly collected uh, a couple Asian swamp eels. So this was the first record for Florida. And because they were near an abandoned fish farm, ornamental fish farm, I suspected that was the uh, cause. Ornamental fish industry in Florida, although it has uh, shrunk in recent years, it has a long history. Uh, there, there have been in the past hundreds of farms, and, they, and these farms escapes are uh, probably responsible for many of the non-native fishes in Florida waters. Surprisingly, uh, it was August when I collected those swamp eels in that ditch. Well, then just within a few weeks, someone in South Florida were sampling uh, water plants and they picked up some swamp eels in a pond near in North Miami. So we responded by starting to do intensive survey, surveys targeting swamp eels. 
Then in 1999, two years later, swamp eels were taken from a third site in Florida at the edge of the Everglades National Park. So this map shows the general location of three swamp eel uh, populations, but recent sampling has indicated they've spread beyond these confined areas. Now in South Florida, swamp eels were found in canals, and these, there are just many hundreds of kilometers of interconnected canals. And the swamp eels and other non-native fish certainly are using these canals as dispersal routes. This is an earlier map that I created when I was heavily involved in sampling swamp eels or searching for swamp eels in the Miami area canals. You can see at that time the red marker, well the star is where the swamp eels were first taken in the North Miami area in the pond. And within months when we started sampling, we found that they were throughout that one canal system. The green ones are sites we sampled with shocker boats but didn't detect or collect any swamp eels. But since then, they have spread. This slide shows the two color marks of the Monopterus uh, complex, uh, the clade C one, the wild type above, and a colorful calico form. Uh, based on the numbers and the samples I'd collected, uh, they make up these colorful forms, form about 10% of the populations, both in the North Miami population and in the Tampa area population. And, and the presence of these colorful farms led us to believe more strongly that somehow the ornamental fish trade was, was, uh, was responsible. However, uh, around 2000 also, someone uh, sent me information about swamp eels being in uh, the live food trade and some ethnic food markets, and I think the first one I received was from Boston. So that started me on uh, uh, sampling live food markets throughout the U.S., wherever I go. If I'm at a meeting, if I'm on vacation, my wife puts up with me, I go visit all the fish markets and, and, and document what live fish and other animals are in these markets. I've also been to Asia a number, number of times, China. My daughter had lived for years in Thailand. I, I look at the markets there, and here's a photo of live swamp eels in some markets in, in China. Here's a photo that I took of uh, in an Atlanta market, uh, ethnic market, supermarket in 2003. And these are members of the Monopterus albus javanensis complex. But surprisingly, during this entire time of some 18 years of sampling, I've only found this complex in two markets. All the other swamp eels that I've found in markets to date now are of this Amphipnus cuchia, and at that time they were not in the wild. One of the, at one of the markets, even though usually they're closed mouth and they don't want to tell you any information, some of the, the market counter people were uh, Latin American. I spoke Spanish with them, and I told them I love swamp eels, and they let me go in the back, and I photographed some of the shipping crates that indicated that these swamp eels were shipped live uh, from Vietnam to Atlanta. Here are some of the areas, uh, places, uh, ethnic markets that I've included in my survey. And of a, a little over 200 markets that I've surveyed to date, I found live swamp eels in 22. And these were in 11 different metropolitan areas in, in, in the U.S. and Canada. This is just real briefly. This is, uh, I obtained from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, that branch of our government maintains records on live imports. There's lots of problems. There's lots uh, with this, these records. Everything that they have in their database is Monopterus albus. None of the fish were labeled as Cuchia, but yet where I have marked are the years that I found uh, Amphipnus Cuchia in these markets. And then also you see this big drop-off 
after about 2007 where, according to the Fish and Wildlife Service records, swamp eels weren't being imported uh, much anymore. But later I discovered that it looked like some of these eels were possibly intentionally misidentified as anguilid eels, possibly to skirt some state regulations for, that didn't allow swamp eels in. So my research on swamp eels, live food markets, and travels in Southeast Asia contributed to my realiz realization also that maybe prayer release was involved because even though these eels are in the markets, how do they get from a market into the wild? Well, uh, Buddhist, Taoist uh, are, are two of the main re religious groups that practice religious prayer release of animals. They see it as a way, by freeing an animal, you're, you're gaining some spiritual benefits. And it's a very serious part of their religion. But I also see it, and other people are realizing that it is an important introduction pathway. This is a, a photo from a recent magazine article out of China showing a group of Buddhists participating in a prayer release ritual. Now, it's not a problem if they're just local fish and they're releasing them, obviously. So even though, uh, as I got into learning more about Amphipnus Kuchia, I had uh, an old newspaper article from 2007 uh, reporting the, uh, a Buddhist prayer release ritual that took place in, in a, along a New Jersey river. And I went back, I obtained the photo from the, the, the corporation that owned the rights to these photos, so a good quality photo. I started looking at them and realized this 2007 release, that's Amphipnus Kuchia. So never were aware that they had ever been released into the wild, even though I was wondering when it would occur. So in recent years, I started getting uh, specimens or getting photo documentation from different individuals. And in a publication I have in press, I put out this map. So I became aware of four introductions of this Amphipnus Kuchia, uh, shown by these red triangles. And the blue dots, circles, are, are markets where I have confirmed the presence of Kuchia in those markets. Now, whether or not there's a connection, you know, it's still somewhat speculative, except for the uh, New Jersey release. One of the release points was uh, in a rural area of Pennsylvania, and at that time, the land was owned by a Buddhist group. So while my paper, it's still, uh, well, it's in press, but it's available online. But while it was in review uh, this past August, uh, a colleague of mine in Louisiana asked me to identify some eels he caught in a bayou in New Orleans. And they turned out to be in Fitness Cuchilla. And it was definitely the other populations were just releases. These are temperate cold areas. The, those eels were probably not uh, going to get a foothold or, or reproduce, but this is in the southern U.S., and these New Orleans swamp eels were definitely reproducing. He was catching small babies as well as adults. This uh, is a climate match analysis that I did, um, and you know how much credence you give to these things, but it's interesting to play with. The, the program is freely available on the internet. So I ran in Fitness Kuchia, plugging in you know, their native range onto what this climate match program would give as its potential range. So above, you can see the hot colors, reds are where, and yellows are where it might reproduce. You can see in Fitness Kuchia you know, could get a foothold in the southern US. Monopterus albus complex shows a much broader potential range that northern range is most likely because, you know, the range map I have for the, the Monopterus complex includes these northern members. They get into northern China and Korea. 
So this is just a rough world map of swamp introductions around the world. They haven't just been introduced into North America. They've been in uh, Hawaii since before 1900, brought in by Chinese immigrants as a food source. There are some places, and this is typical of some uh, non-native fishes, there's areas around the periphery of their ranges where it's uncertain if these collections represent native ranges or introductions, so it's unclear, and maybe some genetic analysis will shed light on that. And it's the same case with some new genetic research that's out there now. They suspect that at least some clades in Taiwan and in Indonesia uh, uh, in Okinawa may be uh, introduced from mainland areas of Asia. Okay. Next, I'll run through quickly the tilapia, the aquatic chicken in, in the Pacific. Polynesian navigators colonized the Pacific and the islands, and they spread pigs and chickens and dogs and rats, but no fish. The Mozambique tilapia, which I'll talk about briefly, is from southeastern Africa. It's been spread throughout the world, uh, as shown by some of these red dots. It's the most urohaline of the tilapia. It, spawn, it can spawn and flourish in fresh brackets and marine waters, even hypersaline waters. It's been introduced starting in the 1950s throughout the Pacific, Pacific Islands. It was pushed as a food fish and as a bio mosquito control agent, considered a wonder fish, but within a short period they realized they weren't very happy with this species. It was causing problems. There's even a report by Lobel in 1980 that the Mozambique tilapia there moved part of the day out into the reef and then during certain tide, part of the tide, when the predators start coming in, they retreat back to the shallows. In Hawaii, Mozambique tilapia on all the islands, all the major islands. However, even after 50 years in, in Hawaii, they are still dispersing. And uh, recently... Uh, we were called to study a group in uh, Coloco Hanukohau National Historic Park where Mozambique tilapia had never been seen before and a population was discovered in 2012. So this is a shot of Aima Kapa fish pond. Here's a study that we had ongoing looking to see if they were just uh, isolated in the pond. They have recently started to spread. Uh, in 2006, we were called to the Galapagos and we helped eradicate an introduced population of now tilapia from El Junco Crater Lake. And so that was a success story. And those are Nile tilapia, which are one of the more the recent tilapia that is being widely introduced. Here are some of the collections. So I'll end by saying a few last words. Uh, I've learned that you never assume the name assigned to an introduced fish is the correct one. I recall once, uh, some 20 years ago, we sent Sven Kulander, a cichlid fish collect, uh, collected in Florida, and he responded by jokingly saying that it was an undescribed fish and he was naming it Cichlosoma floridensi. I've gained some satisfaction after years of documenting the spread and negative ecological effects of introduced fishes that near the end of my career, I'm helping to stop invasive fish motions by helping to eradicate at least a few. And that's the end. Thank you.